Okay, welcome everyone to our uh, next to our current uh, um, uh, today's talk is given by Isabel, and she joined us last year in September, October, uh, as a lecturer, and she's going to talk about her research, uh, which is about the core building aspects of the system. So please don't be here. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, as Sam said, my name is Isabel. I recently joined. And I think so because I joined so late, and because uh, there are very few people here who work on my in my field of research, I thought I'm going to give a very sort of general talk. So this talk is really basically just going to be a general introduction into the whole non-plasma, and then I will sprinkle into it little bits of my own research. As such, I want to turn to the experts. But I welcome any sort of questions. So um, please ask me any question, though. If you are not an expert, I also um, would rather have you be excited about this research and wanting to work with me than uh, leaving forward and not knowing it's good. Um, good. Okay. I will say that I have a member of uh, an associate of VTEX, uh, the National Institute for Theoretical and Computational Sciences, and also the MIT Dean of the Sun Institute. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. I'm also a member of SA CERN. Um, and so if there's anyone who wants to do a project on the theory of work that's done at CERN, there is access to that funding. Okay, so let's start right at the beginning. Um, all of the material, all of the matter that you see around you is made up uh, in some way of elements of the periodic table. And we now know that these individual elements from the period of the periodic table get the properties from the structure of the nucleus of these atoms, right? The number of protons in the nucleus of an atom determines the properties of that element. But since we also know that protons and neutrons are not themselves fundamental objects in nature, that they carry structure themselves, we can actually take this description of nature one level deeper and we get to the standard model of body physics, which contains the matter particles that walks up, down, straight, strong, top, bottom. Uh, the leptons, the force carrying bosons, and I will say nothing more about the standard model, except that I would like to touch on the sort of bizarre aspect of the standard model of particle physics, or the mathematical structure which describes the interaction between these forces and these ones, and then something called confinement. So when we talk about these protons and neutrons having a structure, You'll often hear people say that they contain two up force and a down force, or that neutrons contain two down force and an up force. To be in order, that's true. And so uh, I, will, I will leave it at that for this talk. But just adding them in groups of three is not the only way of adding them. You can also add them in pairs. So you can add quarks in a very fluid degree, so the very color charge, which is there are three kinds of color charges in the same way that there are two kinds of electric charges. We call the electric charges positive and negative because it's a useful analogy. We call the color charges uh, red, blue, and green. Again, it's a useful analogy. But like I said, you can have you can get a color neutral object by adding a quark and an antiquark, so red and anti red or green and anti green. Okay. And at the end of the day, the important point here is that if you try to pull these quarks apart, if you try to say, okay, I've got these two quarks together, but I don't want to study the many body, I don't want to study two quarks, three quarks, I want to study one quark. So you can just take one fork and put it aside, and then there's, you, it turns out you can't do that. So as you try to pull these two forks apart, the nature of the strong force which binds them together is such that there's a region of this space in which, of uh, the distance between them, in which pulling them apart actually increases the force between them. So you put in more and more energy, and as you pull them apart, you to put in more and more energy, and so you have so much energy there, that you just equal to empty squared it and produce to another fork and anti fork there. So that at the end of the day, you're now there with two sets of forks and anti forks. Okay, so putting these forks apart is not going to help you study them in a way where they're sort of freely interacting, but you can do the opposite thing is go another way and try to push them together. So bring them closer together, and you can ask. Well, okay, if it's true that if I pull them further apart, then the interaction becomes stronger. What happens if I bring them closer together? That would bring the interaction down. What's happening? Okay. okay, so 
This is what we try to do in heavy items. We try to put as many ports as close together as we can into a small body. Okay. How do we do that? I'm going to show you a simulation now, which is factually incorrect. But just to create some sort of image in your mind of what we're doing. So what you're going to see is uh, a correct representation. You, uh, you start off with two incoming nuclei, very heavy nuclei, something like lead. It's in the simulation of lead, but be gold, something like that, or xenon, uranium. They are boosted to extraordinary high energies, very, very close to the speed of light. And because of this very high energy, very high velocity, they are the rings contracted. So we will see thin pancakes instead of spheres that you're expecting. They would fly and they put a lot of energy into the space because we have all of this energy in space. You can produce as many quarks as you want uh, with that energy. So they produce a lot of quarks, these carry the color charge. We'll see red, blue, and green objects. And then you have this heat, this group that you've created, this bunch of quarks and gluons expand and cool down. At some point, the quarks are now far enough away from each other that that interaction becomes strong again so that they pull onto the nearest quark. And they have an answer to something that is neutral. Okay, so let's have a look at the simulation. So in come the nuclei. Okay, so we produce lots of like, colored quarks and then comes out and expands. And then what moves out to your detector is all of these neutral polygons. Okay, this is not really correct for several reasons. On the one, you would have seen there's still some remaining color charges. That, of course, is not possible. Uh, for another, there is no, there is here, but what they did, this is a, is a very little type of interaction or stimulation. So there was no plasma here. There was no strongly interacting fluid. But okay, for the main story, a lot of these objects, you produce a lot of particles, and at the end of the day, what reaches you on the inner detector is one of these particles. Okay, good. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about what's going on. So this is the experiment. This is the theorist's view of what's going on. So I have a beam going, and coming in on the one side of my beam is one nucleus and another nucleus, and they will fly here in the middle in some interaction point, and I wrap a, uh, a barrel around my and around the detection point, and all of the particles will arrive in my detector. Now you can study what happens in your detector in different regions. So you can study the far forward region, so the blue region. In the blue region, what happens is that what's really traveling in this direction is most of what was in your nucleus. So everything that's in your nucleus, uh, that these nuclei are high, they move, uh, because the energies are so high, they do go through each other, but there is some conservation of energy and momentum. So some of that energy is, is retained by the other going direction nucleus. And so you do sort of stop varying a little bit. Which means that just that the physics in this direction is high density physics. So you really have all of your remember you had matter colliding with matter, and so you produce a lot of matter, and so the matter, all of that matter just sits in the side. Okay. But in what we call the central region, it's called well, okay, so in this central region, in the direction perpendicular to the beam, physics is very different. This is because because again, the conservation of energy, if you you have momentum in this direction and momentum in this direction, your initial condition has no momentum perpendicular to the beam. So your final state must have no momentum perpendicular to the beam. Which means that every time all of the matter that you produce in this region is produced in the form of quark anti quark pairs going back to back to back from each other. And that means that your your matter, your matter uh, density is zero because your matter minus antimeter is zero. So the textual term is your barrier chemical potential is zero. But it means so even though you produce some a lot of material in this region, your net density is zero, which means that this is the physics of very high temperatures. Okay. I wanted to say very initially I had planned to talk about so my research does fall in these two broad categories, like you do research in both directions. But since my wonder was here last week and spoke about the research that we did in this forward direction, I want to talk about that much more. Um, is it for the benefit of those who weren't here? This physics is interesting because it's the physics density of neutron stars. So in this very, very high density region, we did some calculations to show it that you can get densities that are three times that of normal nuclear density 
which is the density inside neutron stars. And you, it's very difficult to study neutron stars. The astrophysicists in the room will know that studying neutron stars, these things are hundreds of light years away, but they're only a few kilometers across. And so they are very, very difficult to study. And if you can learn something about the equation of state of to high density nuclear matter in a laboratory, you would in a lot of plots. So, but you will notice immediately that I didn't draw a detector over here in the forward direction. And that's because it's really difficult to put a detector there. You can't look at the sun, but you can't put a detector on the beam. In the beam, you will burn a hole for your detector. And so that's quite a difficult problem. But um, I want to talk a little bit about how we thought about things that you can do, like different kinds of experiments you can think about, and then what kinds of theory you can do there. So um, I'm happy to ask some more questions about that if you have, but that is all I will say about the forward direction. Okay. The reason my research falls in this sort of central high temperature region where this is a very well studied region, right? So these experiments are, there are the three large ones at the large hydrogen collider at CERN, uh, Atlas, TMS, and Alis. Then there are the the sort of slew of detectors that existed and no longer exist, and some do exist at the relativistic heavy ion collider in New York. All in all, probably order 15,000 experimentalists working on this kind of data, uh, easily as many theorists. So um, this, this work is very well studied. And I will try to introduce you to some of the concepts here, and then at the end, we'll get to some work that I do. Okay, good. So why do you care about this high density material or this high temperature material? Okay, so here's an image that all of you have seen many times. Uh, this is the evolution of the universe. And we are sitting out here where the temperature is very low. The universe is at an average temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. It's governed by classical Newtonian gravity and also this uh, general relativity and so on. But uh, for the most part, it is not really very much quantum going on. Okay. As we go back in time, as you follow the history of the universe backwards, you very rapidly run into the cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background is the last thing you can see with the telescope. You can't see behind that because behind that is an electromagnetic plasma. So behind that is a plasma of three electro electromagnetic charges, so positive and negative charges that trap the photons. No photon can escape from before that. So from astrophysics, we can learn a lot about the history of the universe, but only up to this point. If you want to know something that goes on behind that, you have to start doing other physics. So you can do, for instance, atomic and atom physics to learn something that's going on there. But if you go even further back, so now we're at sort of a tenth of a second in the history, what's so phase minus five seconds. Um, at this point, it's now not really true that the atoms can no longer bind. It's now so hot that the nuclei can't bind either. So you just have three moving protons and neutrons. Okay. And then if we go one step further back, so now we're at microsecond of the Big Bang. And everything here is this quark muon plasma. The nucleons are no longer able to bind either. So these are now so what? And you are left with just quarks and gluons and then all the other sort of the, the standard model particles, like standard model particles hanging on. And so this is what we try to study because you cannot study it using the So you would like to learn something about this epoch in our history. Um, and it turns out you can do that by just colliding things in a very, very, very large time. Okay, that's the argument we give to the funding agencies. Okay, so this is the more sophisticated simulation of a heavy ion collision. What you're looking at starts at that very red point. That's the, the moment of the interaction. So you collided your two nuclei, and at that moment, you put a lot of energy into the space, and then we see this expansion. So the nuclei have collided, and then they move here, they're moving through each other, and they're moving fast. And they deposited a lot of energy in the middle here. And what you're looking at is isotherms, so lines of constant temperature. And you see, you number know, one, that there's a huge amount of energy deposited in the central region over here. And that it sort of cools down and expands because of this longitudinal expansion. So there's this huge longitudinal expansion. Um, and so this is the much more, uh, much more faithful description. It is also for the experts, this is a real simulation. Um, I put the link here. So here's the archive link for the simulation, but music, music is three plus one dimensional hyperdynamic code that you can download. It's freely available and you can run it on the laptop. It's a nice laptop. And you can create the simulation, which uh, for I'm going to say, I'll just say that you follow the energy 
um, from a sophisticated international condition, you can see that it's lovely, right? I don't have, so not a normal wood Saxon distribution of nuclear matter, but it's quite lumpy. And then it evolves essentially the energy momentum tensor using conservation of energy. Okay. Sorry, what's the response here? Oh, very good. So I start off with very much temperature and then I cool down uh, to blue. So this is this, this yeah, I guess maybe because I'm blue, so it's kind of oh and it's a game, I can't stop it. Um so this is the end. So the this is the start, and then uh but it's the from the moment of the interaction, and so they move through and you see Okay. Any other questions? Any All right. Um Good. So I told you that you do this here's this thing that's expanding. Uh, what I didn't say was that these two nuclei can slow down in the simulation quite dramatically, right? They're essentially moving at the speed of light. So this expansion is moving almost is happening almost at the speed of light. And this temperature is extremely high. It's a hundred thousand times the temperature of the sun. So with this very high temperature, very rapidly expanding thing, which has vacuum essentially outside of it. This expansion is very fast. So the, the, the lifetime of this material here in this middle of the central region is on the order of the Fermi. That doesn't mean anything to you. It's 10 to the minus 23 seconds. So it's a billionth of a billion of microseconds. So if you stole a laser from the lab downstairs and you put it at the nearest detector, a centimeter away from the, from the interaction point, and you fire the laser the moment that the interaction happened, then by the time the laser, the light beam, the photon has traveled the one centimeter distance, this material hasn't existed for a billion, billion times its own lifetime. So I'm trying to take a picture of the dinosaur now, but it's worse than that. Okay, so how do you study this? It's actually quite hard. So here's a picture of an atlas. So atlas is one of the big detectors at CERN. This is a photon proton condition. They died in there, so two deaths. What you're looking at here, um, I don't see the particle physics kids here, so I'll be good. So uh, they don't have very much, but you see here, this is looking down the map, and you see the detector, the, there are sort of layers of detectors around. It's a tracking tracker in the middle, and then the calories is on the outside that measure the amount of energy that was supplied. And the gray lines will be more because those are five coming on from the same event of different collision events. So they are great amounts, so that's fine. And you're just looking at the particles that are colored in green, red, and yellow. And you see this definition of energy here and back to back. And what you're looking at down here is this barrel. So I have a, a barrel that I've wrapped around the interaction point and I've just unfolded it. And so I see the two calorimeter towers for my two jets. And they are back to back in angles. So this is exactly that. Okay, that's very nice in Google. That's beautiful. I can work with that. I can do these physics with that. This is the same detector, and this is a lead lead region now. So now, now every line in this central region is colored. So I can track every line, and you see that this calorimeter just looks like almost like an even thing. In fact, here the calorimeter towers just look like forest. It's an absolute mess. You can't tell anything just from these pictures. You wouldn't be able to tell. The only thing that, so maybe if you're an expert and you notice this one line coming through here, you realize that it's, this is a muon bit, an event with a muon bit. But for the rest, it's just essentially done. There's so much there. So how do we try to make sense of what's going on in this in this event? And how do we learn that there was in fact a problem on plasma? So of course I would create lots of particles. I collided a lead nucleus, 208 nucleons, with another lead nucleus, which is another 208 nucleons, into a three valence force and a whole sea of other forms. So of course I've created a huge number of particles. That's not surprising. How can I claim that I've created the quark one plasma? That's the real question. Okay, so how do you know that you created the quark one plasma? You need three things. So you need to know that you need to see that the signature of the quark one plasma comes from the low heat physics. So this the momentum T is transverse to the B. So the momentum those particles that have a low momentum transverse to B, because that's what arrived in the That's what you're looking at. So you need to see the signatures of the foreground plasma, the QDP, in the low T side. You have to also see it in the high T side. The physics of these two is very different. There's, at the low T side, we have huge numbers of particles that are all interacting at the same scale, same energy scale, the low energy scale, but they're all interacting. 
At the high PT side, you have very few particles that are interacting with these low momentum particles. So you, you have a very high energy scale that's now you know, interacting with something at a low scale. And so you have this several different scales in that problem. And so the, the, the physics is very different from these two. Okay, and then, like any good experiment, like any good physicist, you have to have a control experiment. You have to have an experiment in which you know the Pokemon plasma does not exist, and where you can see that these signatures do not appear. Okay, that will be very important later on, but first I'm going to teach you some jargon. Okay, so bear with me. I would like to teach you three jargon terms, and then, and then I promise it will be over, but then we can talk about this. Okay, so the first one is centrality. So you can imagine that when I collide these nuclei, I, I have no control actually over the overlap, how much overlap there is. What I really have experimentally is you don't really experimentally for the longest time as a theorist, of course, you have a single lead nucleus traveling around the, like under Geneva and then colliding with a single other nuclear nucleus. That's of course not at all what happens. You have bunches of hundreds of lead nuclei traveling several different bunches, and you cross the bunches, and you hope that some of them will fly. So you have no control over how much overlap there is. And even worse than that, technically, you can't even measure how much overlap there was in a given interaction. But uh, there is a proxy for it, and the experimentalists, um, at least in these sort of very, in these very large colliding systems, um, the, the proxy sort of works. And so what you do is you count the number of particles that arrive, and you say, if I get two particles from, if I get the 10 particles from every four quark interaction, and if I got, a, if I had 100 particles, then I have 10 four quark interactions. Okay, that's plus minus how we do that. So what I'm showing here, and what I've got here is on the x axis is something called the V0 amplitude. This is called the number of particles. And on the y axis, I have the number of units. And what you see is that the fastness is long scale, right? So the vast majority of the events happen. With almost no particles having been used. Uh, so almost no that. And then you have some very small numbers. So here this is like this is like three, four hundred, and then down here this is like one, right? So you have like one or two events where you have lots of okay. And so because of the way they historically that they plotted this thing and divided this into groups, the term centrality, which tells you how central this event was, was how much overlap it was, as this. Sort of counterintuitive numbering system. So the most overlap is zero percent centrality, and the least overlap is hundred percent centrality. That's because a hundred percent of the events have no overlap or more, and zero percent of the events have complete overlap. So okay, so this, so just remember that zero to ten percent centrality when is this very central, lots of overlap, and the ninety to one hundred percent when is the almost no Okay, good. That's number one. Questions? Uh, so the overlap would be okay. So what I'm doing is I'm now I'm looking down the barrel down B, and I've got one layer that's coming out of the out of the board. So say this one is coming out and this one is going in. And so when they collide, so one has come this way around the B and this one's come this way around. So when they collide, either they they collide head on. So like in this picture they have collided, they really run head on. And in this picture, they sort of graze each other. I mean, they almost miss each other. Yeah. So this much here's like so this small amount of overlap in there. It's important because the overlap region is where the energy is deposited. So this is where the quarks that are the constituent quarks of the nucleons that make up the nucleus are going to put down the energy. Um, for interest sake, I don't know if it's very interesting, but there is something called all the peripheral regions where you actually can tell when the nuclei were like they didn't actually collide, they didn't overlap, they just went like sliding next to each other, but they were the first now because this is a nucleus that has like, 280 nucleons, so like over 104 protons, and it has no electrons around, it's very, very highly charged and another highly charged, and so they exchange photons, and you can do light by light scattering, which is uh, it's called light by light scattering. So, okay, good, sorry, I get distracted. Fine, okay, number two, flow. So you'll see that I'm going towards, I'm moving towards this low PT high PT thing. So flow, flow is the main observable for low PT, uh, for the low PT physics. 
and then there are those bottles, the very open bottles. So, suppose I have this sort of uh, semi central overlap, so semi central region, where there is only that half overlap. What happens is that I deposit the energy in sort of an oval shape, not a round shape, a root. And because this oval shape, so you have this oval shaped deposition of energy, which has a very high density in the middle and vacuum on the outside. So you have these extremely steep uh, pressure gradients. So there's very steep pressure gradients here because we have two to three times the normal nuclear density here and vacuum on the outside. And this distance is like half the just the length of an atom. So of a nucleus. So you have a very steep pressure gradient. But because it's an oval shape, you have steeper pressure gradients in this direction than you do it in that direction. So the pressure change is much faster from in this direction than in that direction. And since the pressure gradient is proportional to the force by the particles, you find that since the pressure gradient is steeper here, you have a much stronger force in this direction than you do in that direction. So you will find that the particles are pushed perpendicular to this is called the event plane. So in this uh, perpendicular to the event plane, particles are pushed much further, faster, and harder, and vertically to it, it's sort of big, or in this direction, much slower. Okay, you can actually see this in data. Early on already. So here, this is a star measurement, um, and it shows three different spirituality classes, which we're now comfortable with: zero to ten percent, most overlap; thirty-one to seventy-seven percent, the most peripheral. So let's look at this thirty-one to seventy-seven percent thin, so the black squares, these right over here, and this is a function of the angle. So exactly the angle that I'm talking here, uh, and just this is the number of uh, the number of particles in the given thin. It will be given momentum also, of some sort. And you see here at zero radians, I have lots of particles coming in this direction. And then at pi over two, which is now up here, I have fewer. I normalized it so there's fewer here. And then here they're going in the other direction. So now at pi radians, they're going this way. And then at pi over three, pi over four, there's nothing. And then up there, there's all of them coming. Okay, so I see this modulation is the point. And I can do a simple Fourier analysis and I can extract the Fourier coefficients. So I just expand this in terms of sines and cosines, and I will get these coefficients that are uh, that tell you how strong you need. So I do this expansion, I draw this curve, and I expand it, and I get these kind of coefficients called V2. So V2 is the number you will hear for elliptic. So V2 tells me how elliptic my initial condition was. V3 would tell you how triangular it was. V4 would tell you how square, how square it was. Now, if your system is really symmetric and so on, and, you have, and everything is nice, then you don't expect to see V1, V3, V5. But of course, it turns out that you do see them because nature is not so But so V2, the point is that V2, being able to measure V2, means that this interpretation. And I thought of last talk, but now I will draw attention to it. I thought of just suddenly started talking about, and I initially started talking about particles that are depositing energy in a space. And then suddenly I'm talking about pressure and force and gravities and so on. So somehow I've gone into a thermal sort of language. And what I've done is I've assumed that the interactions here are so strong and there are so many, so many interactions that. I'm going to talk about this as a fluid. So this is really a fluid, and the fluid, a fluid is something that can have pressure and temperature. Right? And you need that language of the fluid to be able to say that I can take this spatial anisotropy and transform it into a momentum. Without the fluid language, the spatial anisotropy does nothing. Without the fluid, without the fluid language, I just produce a bunch of particles and they move off randomly so that I have uniform particles in my system. Okay, so that's flow. Good. Flow tells you that you have a fluid. Good. And uh, you think of the fluid as being com uh, composed of uh, quarks and gluons? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, and okay. yeah, on some sort of microscopic level, I guess. Yeah. But the uh, you don't need that description. Um, you need you need that incredible state to do this. So this this language produced that. Um, that simulation I showed you before, which was a hydrodynamic simulation. And so you do need an equation of state, which is the equation of state, which is the QCD equation of state from lattice. Uh, so you compute that on the lattice and then you. So, okay. we're talking about distinguishing whether you have this QGD uh, 
these slides earlier. Uh, we have to combine um, state of matters, five phase. The going to spawn and find um, QGP phase. We're adopting for an agonal mode. Why not just call this phase transition and look for some word parameters and see what the phase is? Why do you need to go through this, uh, um, this description? Uh, yeah, so um, this is uh, something. So I, okay, uh, I wonder, I, I kind of deliberately did not draw the base diagram because it's quite, I might not have any practice. I'm going to do real talk soon. No, 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 okay, so here's the, the base diagram. No, no, it's, um, so uh, when I, this was the slide that I took out on my forward direction side. But here's the base diagram, QC base diagram. So I have uh, on this axis, I have the net diagram of density and on the y axis, I have the temperature. And so uh, because in this region, we're able to compute, uh, we have that, we do this experiment sort of, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of times a day in three weeks. And uh, so there's lots of data, and then you can compute something like, you can extract something like one. Absolutely. Because the order parameter is the, like, they, they, uh, the way that you measure them experimentally, but now we're sort of going into it a little bit. I'm not really an expert, but my understanding is that the way you measure these things experimentally is you measure humans and so measure humans and so you need a lot of data for that. And so it can be done here, but it can't be done over here. So we know that we know what the space oxygen, uh, we know what this, the first one is. We know exactly what's going on here. What we don't know is when you come down in this direction. Um, and, and so that's the one thing. Um, and then what I will, what I will get to is that, uh, but you, yeah, so even the extraction of this, um, these cumulants requires a highly dynamic description. Right? And that extraction of what's so, um, so, yeah, good. I wrote that up, probably just, um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, you have to be convinced that the description is correct. Yes. And then we'll describe it correctly on the other side of the base. Okay, great. The last piece of jargon I want to teach you is uh, particle expression. Okay, so this is going to be the observable on the hypothesis. So on the hypothesis side, so here um, I've drawn, so far I'm showing data that which is the number of particles per event, so this is some sort of uh, a, a spectrum, as a function of the momentum on the log scale. Yeah. And the point that I wanted to make here is that, like in any behavior quantum field theory, you produce particles on a, with a spectrum, the CP4 spectrum. So most of your particles are produced at this low BTN. And then you produce far, far, far fewer particles out here. So here, the 100 GeV as this is measured out to a TeV. So you see that here, so we're producing particles on 15 orders of magnitude. But that means that uh, even though in any given central division, you will produce a lot of low momentum particles that are producing this fluid background, you do have a low probability of producing very high energy particles. And when you produce these very high energy particles that are produced, like everything else in a four anti four pair and move back to that. So I've drawn here some sort of fluid background with my oval state, and I've got a four anti four pair. And what you will find is that even though these, because they conserve energy, they have the same energy, these two forks, and one will move off through the plasma without interacting at all. Because if I'm lucky enough and I produce it on the edge, this one goes off and doesn't interact. The other one moves through this plasma. Now, the fork itself has colored charge and it's moving through a colored plasma, and so it's interacting and using energy. It's fundamentally changing what it looks like as opposed to being in a vacuum. So, what you can notice on the other side is uh, it's modified in several ways, but the main way, or the instrumental way, is that it uses energy. It hasn't, of course, lost the energy, it's sort of bumped against this plasma and has passed that energy off into the plasma, sort of thermalized off into the plasma. But what you may do is a high PT thing on this side and a lower PT thing exactly back to that. So if you will, and so that's J function, that's particle expression. So you measure, you, you can actually measure that the number of particles in a given momentum bin is lower in a heavy ion condition than it is in a proton. If you will forgive me, I would like to belabor this point a little bit because it is the core of my research. So I work on jets, and so I will just talk about these jets for a little bit longer. Uh, good. So this is what it looks like in, a, in the atmosphere. Again, I'm looking down the barrel here, and you see that on this side I have 
some spray of particles, because of course what happens is you have this low core, but we don't really know how the hydronization process works. So there's always some spray of particles that arrives in your detector, even if there's no interaction. So even in photon proton collisions, we have something called a jet, which is a collimated spray of particles. So that's fine. But on the other side, I see that all of this energy has been dissipated, and you can see that it's sort of gone into a wider angle as well. So it goes into this wider angle. Um, good. Okay, so this is what it looks like in a detector. So you can really see it in an experiment. You see it like it's really sort of something that absolutely does happen. Um, this is the clear description of what happens. So here again, I'm taking my had my barrel and the metric which is wrapped around, and I've just unwrapped it. And you see the calorimeter kind of power. So here's a very micro T particle that's right here, and back to back to where the lower PT particle that's around this. Okay. I can be more quantitative about this by measuring the following observations. Another rule called the nuclear modification factor, or RAA. RAA is the word I would use. The AA stands for the nuclear, the nuclear, the nuclear numbers, or LEDs. So this would be R, L, 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 two of each of these. Okay, what you do is you include the number of particles in a given T bin. I'm saying how many particles are in my in my LED LED collision, how many are in this T bin, and I compare that distribution to the exact same distribution in a proton box. So the number of particles in that same momentum bin in proton particle And then I have to, of course, scale it, because of course I would have more particles in their definition. I have to scale it by some number, which tells you how close one lead lead collision is to 208 proton proton collisions. So if I was to just say 208 proton proton collisions, does that look the same as one lead lead collision? So that's what this observable is a ratio, but it's observable method. If it's one, then a lead lead collision is exactly the same as 208 proton proton collisions. Maybe it's the same. But if it's not one, then there's something else happening. Okay, good. And here is the data. Now, okay, this plot is truly actually quite a remarkable plot. It's really actually extraordinary that this that the amount of physics that's in this plot. So you see here these yellow triangles and the red circles. These are high zero and you see that suppression, fine, and this is on the lower cross, so it's actually quite a lot of suppression, right? And 90% suppression. Okay. The point zeros and the inters are suppressed. But remarkably, they are suppressed by exactly the same amount. So the five zeros and the inters are suppressed by the same amount. And if you are not aware of exactly what the five zeros and the inters are, they are two mesons, but they so uh, or anti four pairs uh, mesons, but they have very different masses, very very different. Five zero is sort of five times larger than eight, which means that if they are if they have the same suppression. It means that the suppression must be happening to the quarks. It's not happening to the mesons. You're not having a situation where the mesons are, uh, there's been some interaction, you produce some mesons, and then the mesons are in some way suppressed or modified. That's because they would have been modified differently. They modify the exact same way, so it must be the quarks. And then, just to prove that we've sort of done this normalization correctly, the purple squares are the photons. So, because photons carry low color charge, they don't interact with the plasma and they go straight through. And so very comfortably, the photon RA is one. Okay, so this plot is said to you, several things. It says there is this modification, and modification is definitely happening to force, and it's definitely not happening to force. So you probably well, must have something here that is a, a strong interaction that's modifying your IPT particles. Okay, I'll say one more thing about this plot, and it's this yellow line, which is the GFM GLB. The theoretical calculation. I draw your attention to it partly to say, wow, look how great it is, it gets the data exactly right. Okay, that's maybe not so surprising, and as there are some like anything there are parameters that you can that you can play with. But GLB actually does well, so this is only zero to twenty GB, but actually GLB does well all the way up to sort of four hundred GB. So it's a very it does a good does a good job. Um, and I wanted to draw your attention to it because we will come back to you this time. So I work on this. I work on this field. Okay, good. So, what do you think of as high PT and low PT numbers? Ah, yes, good, very good. Uh, so any um, uh, so it so it depends. Um, who you ask, but a little bit sort of nebulous. Um, but you will find that sort of V two plots are never above more than a few GB. Oh, ah, I will show V two plots on the next. One. Okay, hold on. Uh. So a few GB is low to T. Actually, the vast majority of particles that are produced are around half. So really, you're talking about a half, maybe one, or two, something like that. Everything higher is considered high PT. Um, although, um, if you uh, if you ask a jet person, 
uh, or like the heart, like so this. Uh, if you're looking at the separatum, it's hard to see separatum at the two to six GB um, scale because it's like thermalizes quickly. So maybe a more uh, technically correct answer is that anything below the temperature, below or at the temperature of the plasma, below the T, but the plasma can be in like so far. Maybe up to about one. And I think um, the suppression is not it's difficult really to do. Great. You'll see that this line doesn't extend all the way down here. Yeah, well, that, it doesn't match in the brands and the circles don't match it around two, for example. Oh, no, they do. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that's very young. It's like what we are was here. I think that this 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 long air bar, probably the first one, or maybe that's more one, is the yeah. is the ETA. But it's, um, I don't know. I don't think experiments must be taken that seriously. With the related bit, what is the error on the error part? Oh, it means that I don't know what the lower limit is, and because it's a long scale, it's zero. So the, the uh -huh. lower limit of the error box. Yes, they are the same for people. Uh, just ask Levi and we did. Yeah, they, there's a. Um, uh, there's a fairly simple and reasonable way to write down what the energy loss would be, but it's four. You can calculate it. And then there are several different groups that have taken different limits of this expression to compute the energy loss. And you go into one limit, and then there's several other limits. And yeah, I mean, these people build entire careers uh, on these computers. Okay, very good. So let's recap quickly the, the jargon I talked about. We spoke about centrality, which had this opposite direction. Both central is 0%, central is 100%. We spoke about flow, which tells you that you can transform spatial anisotropy into a momentum anisotropy. And then we spoke about the jet quenching, which tells you that a high heat particle has been modified by the presence of the Okay, good. So now we, don't, now we get to the physics that I wanted to. Oh, very good. Um, that I so you'll remember that I said to you in order to claim you produce the core field plasma, you have to see the signature in the low T, you have to see the signature in the high T, and you have to have a control experiment. You have to have an experiment where it is not. So they try to do it, and of course, um, it sort of makes sense. Uh, if you think about a lead nucleus, it has so many nucleons inside of it that it's unreasonable to imagine that the physics would be the same as just 208 protons. It's really, it's really that there's a lot of nuclear physics is very rich. There's there, it's an entire field by itself. So it could really be modifying what you see. And so one way that you might think to do this is to say, well, okay, let's take the lead nucleus and let's probe it with the proton. So we do proton lead conditions. Uh, so we do this proton lead. And due to everybody's water, they discovered that you in these conditions. You measure the low T signatures of the corpulent plasma, they're there. You can see those signatures in the low T. But you don't see the high T signatures. And so, and in any case, this was a control experiment. There wasn't supposed to be any corpulent plasma there. You shouldn't be seeing any flow ever. Okay, so this has led to an entire field of research, um, which is sort of affectionately called small systems. And small systems now includes uh, very peripheral lead collisions, these proton lead collisions. But they even measured these slow coefficients in high multiplicity proton proton collisions and in medium level and sort of, and so it's one of these sort of smaller colliding systems, anything that's not a central AA. Okay, let me try to frame the problem for you in a more sort of slightly form. Okay, this is how I do it. So we have this very self consistent paradigm in AA. Here I'm not plotting. RAA, which I've spoken to you about, which is this uh, IPT measurement, and B2 and okay. what? Okay, and I somehow managed to find ones that are at the same PT range. Okay, so this is for heavy for heavy quarks, doesn't matter, physics transfer. And the way we understand this paradigm is that, okay, we understand that at low PT, oh, everything that's happening here, this rise in the B2 at low PT, this rise, is due to an increase in the number of particles that are there, and they are interacting in these multiple interactions, and they are creating a fluid, and this results in this P2. Okay, then you understand that I haven't spoken about this kinetic concept in this intermediate P2, and I'm just sort of 10 or so uh, GD. Um, but suffice it to say, I also understand the fall off again. So there's a fall off in the B2 because we understand how the kinetic theory works. And then we understand, uh, we understand the RAA in this region. Exactly. Precisely, this is the energy lot. We even um, we even think we understand 
how how high Vt V2 we found out. So you have this um you have a non-zero V2 that's in these very high Vt regions. And what we believe that is from is that you have uh that because we had this almond shape, we have this almond shape. If you have a jet that goes in this direction and a jet that goes in this direction, this one will lose less energy than that one. And so even in your high PT bin, you would see more particles here than you do there. And so as long as you haven't um, event by event set to or event plane in the same way, you will also see this modulation in the height. Okay. Um, so we think we understand that in AA, but we're very happy with everything seems fantastic. But the interpretation is unclear. It's all systems. So what I'm showing you here is now this is called proton dead. Uh, yeah, proton dead. It's an atlas measurement. It's a very recent one. It's from 2022. Uh, so just for context, this problem first appeared in like 2013, and um, people thought it would just go away. Experiments this would make the error bar small. It would work out. It hasn't. And experimentalists have worked very, very hard to try and come up with observables that are so free of. Um, all kinds of bias on. So this observable is not all of the dead, but it doesn't matter. It's essentially the same thing. It has the same interpretation. If R if I be dead is one, then there's no modification. If it's not one, then there's some. And you see here again in the V2, there's this right in V2 of P dead, there's a fall off in the kinetic region, and then there's this high PT V2. This is the short next like this is the log scale. So now I have log scale here. You can see I can measure at this point. I should say it like that. Atlas has measured that they that they can measure the V2 of a 40 GeV or 50 GeV in the 40 to 50 GeV bin. Okay. Regardless of whether or not you believe that, you have to somehow try to understand why there is even sort of a need to be here. Because if you look at your RV there, okay, maybe I can argue that there is some sort of shape there, right? So I can connect dots in some shape, and maybe this thing is just scalable. Because on this side, I have the same horizon. And maybe there's some normalization problem. Okay. But any experimentalist will tell you that that is nonsense. You know, theorists like to connect the dots, but you're not allowed to. This is just as reasonable. Let's do that. Thing about it. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you, uh, you can't just go and do whatever you want here. The fact, the actual, I think, one of the most sort of established facts is that R E there is one. Regardless of the bit. So they've even chosen a looking system at zero to twenty percent bit. So it's even a small um small sort of centrality bit. Um I have argued with them, I would like to know why this is why they did this measurement zero to twenty percent and this one is zero to five. And then they want me to believe that these two uh things are the same. But okay, that's a technical point and we won't argue with them. The fact is, where is the energy loss? So if there is if there is a problem around that time, like this rather than the V2, it's because of the presence of a Pokemon that's not. You can just pop into your energy loss population at a smaller distance, and you will get it, and you expect to see energy loss. You expect to see it, so that's, that's a fact. The theory says that you should expect to see it. Uh, does that mean that the theoretical calculation of the energy loss is wrong? Does it mean, or does it even more terrifying, does it mean that this interpretation is wrong? That the interpretation that this V2 is the result of this liquid Thinking that has um, allowed you to transform your spatial and into into an internet. So, which interpretation is wrong and not into Okay, I don't know very much about hydrodynamics. I don't work on the slow PT side, but I have uh, tried to work on the high PT side to try to calculate what the energy loss phase should be if it is there. Okay, and so I would say ten minutes to talk very briefly about um, how we try to answer this. So this will start becoming a little bit technical, but um, I hope not actually very much. So, okay, where did the model in? So the first thing you can try to do is do perturbative quantum chromodynamics. Do some PQCD calculation in the style of GLB that I showed you that yellow line. And the way that those calculations work is you have a brick. So you model the medium as being some static brick, which has scattering centers. And uh, with these scattering centers, you calculate diagrams that look like this, Feynman diagrams. So if you're not familiar with Feynman diagrams, it doesn't matter. I think the the uh, interpretation is reasonably clear. You have some production point of the particle, you a high PT fork that you absorb. It exchanges some momentum with the with your medium, your scattering centers. Yeah, this dot, that dot. 
And then as a result of being accelerated, it radiates to this branch off. Okay. So as this result in energy. And if you do a Feynman diagram, when you calculate Feynman diagram and calculate these integrals, you will get contributions to that integral from these two propagators. You have a contribution from this propagator and from that one. But you also have a contribution from the potential from your modeling of the medium. And what happens in a standard GNOV calculation is that you assume a hierarchy of scales, which allows you to say that the system is very large compared to the mean free bar. So now what you need is that the mean free bar is large compared to by screening and so all of the sides of this, this scattering system. You need that to be true, but you don't really need the large system approximation. It just simplifies the mathematics because this approximation takes away the contribution from this pole. So now you have only two contributions to the diagram. And so your typical calculation is short. So this calculation is 10 meters long and the whole calculation is 80 meters long. Okay, so good. So we did this, we do this calculation, and it went out to get an absolute chop. So <laughs> what you get is that this entire system of approximations just collapses. So um, what we have subsequently done is you can put your answer, what how you calculate the semi loss which is a very sophisticated um, simulation, and you get what your prediction would be for RP dead. So here's RP dead, some data points. And then uh, the solid, the dashed lines are the original GLB calculation, and the solid lines are the GLB with this correction, including this one. So solid lines are the solid lines are arguably conceptually the correct calculation for a small system. But uh, then the red and blue are different models for this for this medium for this form. Okay, and what you find not. Well, it's not surprising that you it's not surprising that you find that the calculation becomes very sensitive to the choice of the medium. So you see that the difference between the solid lines is much bigger than the difference between the depth. That's because the GLB calculation is not sensitive to the medium model, but if you include the contribution from the medium, you become sensitive to the model of the medium. Okay. But either way, it doesn't really matter. Either way, you don't know, Either way, you see the GLB predicts this expression, the data is no expression. You can get this expression with the correction, but uh, you better find a way to argue that your calculation is only valid between 20 and 80 G. Okay, so, so we're working on this. Um, I have been working on this for a while, and recently in the last sort of two years uh, or year or so, I um, had an idea for what I wanted to do. So if anyone's keen to do a really nice and gnarly analytic calculation, then you know it. I have an idea. Okay. For this is probably your failure of perturbation. This is failure of perturbation. This is normal perturbation theory. Yeah. Yeah, it's QCD. You're doing QCD. Yeah, it's QCD. So I'm helping you're on me helping. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, very, very good. Uh, so uh, we you we're doing QCD in the high control limits. So you do QCD in some very sort of high energy limits. So that yeah, you're right. This you're right. Uh, this Coming this week. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, good. Okay. You have a bigger problem, though. So, uh, we realized very quickly, and it's that small is not your only problem. It's not just that these systems are smaller than other systems, they actually turn out to be hotter as well. So, you think that what you're doing to be reasonable is to compare two systems with the same number of produced particles in there. Because to you, in your mind, that's the, that's the experimental proxy. Or the size of the collision area is the number of these particles. But smaller systems with the same number of particles are hot because the number of particles is proportional to the energy, right? The energy that you put in this volume. But if you put the same amount of energy into a smaller volume, you have a higher energy density, it means that you have a higher temperature. So smaller systems are hotter than large systems at the same moment. So you see when you did a simulation for lead lead, and on the on argon, argon, and oxygen, oxygen. This is 208 nucleons, 16. So, but they all have the same number of huge particles. You see that you get these hot spots. But in the previous calculation, in the PPC calculation, something that you just put in is these, oh, actually, I didn't get Something that you just put in is these, uh, that I was telling you, set scale, right? The size of the system is much larger than the mean free part, it's larger than the, than the uh, scattering size. And these things depend on the temperature. So if you're sensitive to that temperature because your system is different, then your calculation must be different. You can't have the same, it's not the same calculation. And in any case, uh, this 
calculated this, these quantities are calculated in thermal field theory. So what we did was to try to see what happens if you take a thermal field theory and you put it in a box. So instead of having some infinite system, if you do anyone if you've done with thermal field theory calculations, maybe are you done in that to London? I will tell you. When you do a thermal field theory calculation, you have to put boundary conditions on your field. And typically what you do is you do with periodic boundary conditions. But the periodic boundary condition is the same thing as having the infinite system. So if you want to have a small system, you put some other boundary condition, zero state boundary condition, whatever you choose. And what we found is that if you do this, so you can just look at the red curve, red curve is four blocks, so I have zero state boundary conditions in all three dimensions. And I just compared this to the state on both limits of the infinite system. And what you find is that, oh, sorry, uh, this is temperature. I think, I'm sorry, length in Fermi. So even for reasonable Fermi, you find that 20, well, I mean, 20 to 40% difference between your system that is confined and your system that is infinitely large. It's a huge difference. Okay, for the experts, I will say that we did not do this calculation. We did this calculation for a single non-interacting massless scalar field. So, uh, it's as simple as you can get. It's a very difficult calculation, okay? And we haven't computed, been able to compute the device screening name here, but um, we, we have some ideas of how we do that. Maybe you sort of step a little bit. But QCD is different. But I think the physics argument holds. You take a quantum field theory and you put it, you put limits on it that are on the scale of its temperature, or on the length limits on the scale of its temperature, then you run into problems. Okay, one other thing that I've worked on, um, which I will just briefly touch on, and it's um, so now I'm going to do this. What were the elements of the box with the uh, proton laid for example? Uh, so, if you uh, so the well, what do you mean? Why did you do this application in the internal? Oh, because I wanted to, what I really wanted to compute was the device screening. Link. So, the thing is, like, it was to try and compute the device screening name uh, for a field theory that has uh, that, that's genetically compliant. Combined with some sort of okay. volume of space, yeah. Um, you run into very difficult to do just problems um, from the thermodynamics perspective. It's actually difficult to do these integrals. The um, or the even the derivatives, the we're going to do some banking on the word. There's a special there's a word for you can only do the the John transform if the um if your curve so let's see, I'm sorry. It, yes, yeah, for this, and then what, you, what happens is you have a phase constant, which, which means that part of your population goes out of this sort of valid region. Yeah, it's a kind of cool problem for a mathematician. <laughs> okay, uh, the last thing that I worked on is that instead of trying to do some analytical thing, these other two populations were very analytical. Uh, what if you just threw it on a computer and see what happens? And so, but you can imagine that a Monte Carlo simulation of tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand volumes, very computationally expensive. So there aren't very many models that do this, but there is one that's sort of specifically designed to look at jets. It's called Jewel, Jet Energy Loss, Jet Emission with Energy Loss. This is also open source software that you can download and run on your laptop tonight if you want to. Um, it ships with a setting where you run this jet and you've all this jet in vacuum, so no Pokemon plasma background, or you can run it with some simple background. But the simple background is a really symmetric static medium that um, it's kind of hard to sort of fiddle with if you want to think about other physics. It's really designed for central data. So uh, I have worked with the authors of this code and we have sort of modified it quite significantly to be able to take in any two plus one the hydrodynamic background. So if you run your favorite fancy hydrodynamic background, you can feed it into Dual and Dual will evolve the jet on that background. And so that's what I've been looking at. And I have uh, a Google concept uh, got an acquiescence. Okay, so in summary, um, I tried to argue that heavy iron conditions give you some insight into sort of the early universe and neutron star physics. Um, I hope you were unconvinced by that argument. We have not really been able to make that connection explicit, but it is interesting physics just because it is physics of material that doesn't really exist anywhere else in the universe. Um, I tried to explain to you that most of the work that happens in this field is divided into low T physics and high T physics, but that the question of the control experiments has become a very, very interesting one. And then uh, in the last couple of minutes, I just talked to you a bit about the research that I do in small systems. I do some control with the quantum chromodynamic fit expression, 
do some thermal field theory and reach someone's color physics. And so there's really a huge variety of stuff to do. And this problem is not being solved. So just let's see how it goes. Thank you very much. Any questions for you? Uh, so your I mean the controller, you can't make sense of the controller, right? So is there a problem plasma or uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I really don't know what the answer is. And I think um what? I think one of the problems is that hydrodynamics is so successful. Hydrodynamics has been able to describe um I haven't even shown I don't know why. I haven't shown any of these like really sophisticated hydrodynamic simulations of very large groups. They do huge Bayesian analyses on where they sort of fit the, even though like hydrodynamics has their single parameters, it is sort of set like, you know, four parameters of the and elephants. But they have, um, they really sort of tried very hard to sort of uh, tune in one system and then run their Bayesian analysis on like all the other systems. And they really seem to be getting the right answer. Even if, even sort of in these very small proton proton systems where maybe you have 10 or 12 particles, and how can you really argue that you can thermalize 12 particles? What is the temperature of 12? But um, they can fit the data. So they save on worry about the interpretation data, it will be the data. But if you don't want to believe that, then you have to say, well, okay. Uh, but the temperature is the values for the number yeah. of nucleons there. I mean, no, 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 I'm talking about the number of reduced particles in the final scene. Yeah, so so you're right. The value, uh, you know, no, in a protein, you can have only six phases. But um, you can produce, say, like in high multiplicity one, maybe you produce. And okay, so the very in the C there are many works. Yeah, in the C show, which would be like we pull those up, right? I'm not, I'm not even talking about the issue. I'm talking about once once you've done the condition, how many particles have you produced? After you produce particles, now you're like, okay, I'm here with the C stuff, 10 to 12, maybe you still 100. You can really get to, you can really get. Very bad. You can, they they claim to have been able to cut to measure the width with a hundred particles, which is to say that you have you have a hundred particles moving through this medium, it leaves a weight in this background. And they claim that they can measure the width in a hundred particles, but it's longer. So I don't know what to do. Question? This will actually be fast wearing the uh, C and so on. We know, for example, that for a proton, most of the angular invention. Is in the C and not in the else works. Uh, so why would I be surprised that proton matter, proton, proton things are strongly PCD like if uh, we already know the C and the works already influence uh, you know, things at small scales? Yes, yeah, so I don't think the argument is that I don't think that it was, I don't know quite what you mean by the QCD like, but what I what what's what I think is surprising is that you have this connective field that that your final state body. Now, so uh, you're right. Okay, so I uh, I I deposit some energy uh, in a way that's related, of course, to this to the, the C force. Right? But uh, and in fact, this like CGC business guy right, uh, that Roger was talking about when he was here and so on. Um, and uh, that's true. But how do you trans how do you translate this spatial anisotropy into the momentum anisotropy in the finds not in the range? Um, and in fact, so there have been some studies that were so people say, okay, well, what if you're what, what if you don't really what if you already have a momentum and a sort of in the initial sense? I think maybe that's the point which you have you have all this momentum that's carried by the by the sequence you have sort of yards, and uh, you have a momentum and sort of in the initial state. And they did this they did the calculation and um it's uh the uh the experimental result that showed that this calculation doesn't get you where you want is the following. Um, um, what you find, so uh, they do, you do, you do two out of two collisions, you do one medium gold collision, so something that should be triangular, and you want to do one uh, deuteron gold, so something that should have a elliptic shape. And in this collision, and the functional of the T, uh, the V2 or V3, you should find that the, the V3, the V3 is higher than the V2. So for this vision, you, if your, if your argument is, uh, if your argument is that you have hydrodynamics, you should have higher V2 and higher than higher V3 and higher V2. Uh, in this one, you should have that the V2 is higher than the V3. 
because this is an elliptic system. Okay, good. Hydrodynamics is able to fit all four of these curves. The CDC calculation, which gives you this momentum and isotropy, gives you the same P3 in both systems and the same P2 in both systems. It doesn't have this hierarchy of the P2, P3 because it's just an arbitrary momentum and isotropy. So it gives you the same number. So, yes. Uh, that's a very, it's a cool measurement. Thanks for the question. Um, maybe I, I'm part of the problem here. Um, but if you have, you said you have actual bundles. So in the proton, uh, proton, um, late um, collision, it can happen that you have more than one proton you see late. Uh, I, my, um, my, I will ask someone. My intuition is that um, they, they have very sophisticated pileup software. So they, they can tell when, uh, when you have several collisions in the same space. Now the question is, do you have, can you have two protons that are the same thing? Well, I, I don't know what the spacing is between protons in the, in the bundle. Yeah, so they can be very unlikely. I will ask someone now. They can have a good question. Any other questions? The rest is between people. And hope to see you at one of the next.